Welcome back to another PT Pearl. I'm Doc Jen. And I'm Dr. Dom. And this is part of the Optimal Body Podcast. Today we are talking about meniscal injury in the knee. And honestly, even if you don't have meniscus injury or you've never had it, you're still going to want to pay attention. So the menisci are these two little C-shaped or moon-shaped pads in the knee, basically, that offer a lot of the cushioning for the impact that goes through those knees. And it just offers a lot of surface area. They're a super complex tissue with all these different layers, and they're very hydrated, especially earlier in life. But they take a lot of pressure. So different people, for different reasons, of course, will get injury. And the thing about these pads is they have vascularization, meaning that they just get blood flow only mm -hmm. kind of on the outer bits of them and the insides don't get a ton of vascularization, so blood flow or nerve input. So it's just very variable as to what we do with them when people have injuries or if there are tears, what kind of tear it is, what layer of the meniscus it's in, how are we gonna deal with that? So um, we're not gonna dive too much into like the research and stuff of this, we're more so going to talk about things that we can do to help optimize the way the knees might be feeling. Yeah. So, I mean, especially if we're talking degenerative meniscal injury, so that usually comes, it's degenerative as is most things in our body, you know, or later on in life. So uh, meaning sixties and above, usually you're going to see this coming up on, in, on imaging more often than not, even if you don't have symptoms or pain or anything happening in, happening in the knee, you might have degenerative changes on the image. And this also usually goes in conjunction with osteoarthritis in the knee as you get older, again, above 60 and these different changes that are happening. Yeah. And the other kind of group that will have these um, more often than others is athletes or people in that you know younger age range that are just doing a lot of impact to the knees that have more of a traumatic injury because they pushed their body to a position that they weren't comfortable in they weren't mm -hmm. safe in and they couldn't control in and then we have traumatic injury which is something that i had happened to me you know i was playing football all throughout college and i never quite injured myself on the field and then of course when i'm messing around with my buddy on the snow <laughs> I, I kind of were like shoving around and my foot slipped and caught into some dry, a dry patch and twisted. And the next morning I wake up and my knees all swollen because I, well, I remember it happened and I kind of went down, but I got back up nice and quick because we we're just messing around and noticed something was wrong with my, with my knee, but it was nice and swollen for about a month. I was honestly still doing all sorts of activity and stuff. Finally went into the doctor's office and he comes back in after the image or the MRI and he says, oh my gosh, this is like a really bad bucket handle tear and blah, blah, blah. And he was shocked that I could still even like move my knee through the full range. So I had one year of football left. I'm like, take it out, doc. I got to play football and had a meniscus surgery on one side. And then turns out in PT school, I was trying to offload my knees by doing a little swimming and doing a really hard whip kick or frog kick <laughs> in the pool. Of course, I get out of the pool after that and I had the same exact feeling in my left knee. And I'm just like, what the heck? Like, I'm trying to do this to take pressure off my knees. And I tore my left meniscus or I never had an image of it. But all of my PT professors started to do tests on it. They're like, yeah, you probably tore your medial meniscus of your left knee. But the, the complete difference in how they approach it was just like, you're fine. Like, you still have mm -hmm. good strength. You still have good, mm -hmm. you know, range of motion at your knee. We've gone over this already. You know, you know what to do for this. Mm -hmm. And so that was so empowering to me. I know that you talk a lot about your neighbors. And if you have <laughs> neighbors that aren't, you know, great, the knee is going to take a lot more pressure. So those yeah. neighbors being the ankle and the hip. If we have limitation in mobility at the ankle and hip, we likely are going to compensate with the knee. Yeah. The knee just becomes victim because it's, it's overworking now for what's not working well at the ankle and at the hip. And so, especially at the ankle, when we're talking about the restriction, you're probably more looking at because meniscal injury happens more with kneeling and squatting and going down into that deep squat position, especially degenerative. That's like, you know, working over time in that squatting position. If you don't have good ankle dorsiflexion, meaning that the ankle is coming up or the bottom, the top of the foot is coming up toward the shin 
That is ankle dorsiflexion. And one of the ways that you could just test this, if you go all the way down to the ground and you kind of put your, and you just like, um, how can I, like small kneel? <laughs> it's not <laughs> half kneel. You have one foot on the ground and one you're kneeling on the down ground. on the other yeah. one. And you just try to see like, can I even lean my knee over my toe? If your knee does not go past your toe without your heel lifting up, you probably have a restriction in your ankle. If our hips aren't able to rotate well, and if our hips aren't able to then control through that rotation, we might tend to compensate by, well, first of all, with the foot, we might tend to compensate for lack of dorsiflexion by rotating our feet out. Mm -hmm. And then that's a problem. And that's something I did all throughout college where then my knees would even if I would rotate my hips out as far as I could, my knees would still fall kind of inside my toes when I would do heavy squats and things like that. So I was just kind of setting myself up for it. A place that a lot of people don't explore a ton is their mobility into rotation, right? Or they're more so great at rotating in one direction and not the other. So yeah, one of Jen's favorites, and this has become one of my favorites, is the 90-90, if I can fit on this table. <laughs> <laughs> the 90-90 where you kind of sit with 90s and we've gone over this before and you can test both your internal rotation by sitting back into that hip and then leaning forward to kind of test the external rotation at either of those hips as well. Yeah, and we've shown this a million times. So if you just scroll Instagram or YouTube at Dr. Fit or Dr. Dom DPT, you will find these, I promise yeah. you. Um, and it's just a really easy way to start to explore the hip in this rotation because again, you need rotation in the hip if you want better flexion. So I would say, how much is your knee actively moving in, in the different ranges and the different planes that the knee can move? So our knee moves both in flexion and extension and also in rotation and there's good easy ways to kind of actively just see okay how much can I extend that knee actively or straighten that knee actively and how much can I flex that knee actively or bend it actively without pain or without approaching any of that discomfort. Sometimes it's not just an active like hamstring thing it's also a mobility in the quad. Remember like if you're getting trouble like pulling that that leg into its full range of motion don't just look at how much strength you need into that range but look at what could be restricting it on the other side and that's the quad that top of the thigh that could be really restrictive and adding a lot of pressure into that knee as well it's those twisting injuries that are or the twisting mechanism that is where a lot of these meniscal injuries happen so if you can get used to rotating that tibia actively, isolating what you're doing with your thigh and getting used to rotating that lower part of your leg. Yeah, the lower leg. Tibia yeah. is the lower part of the leg underneath the knee. Totally. And then just exploring that. How much can you rotate it? How much can you rotate it the other way? It's kind of shocking how little we can actively move that. But when you put a little bit of attention into it, you can get some progression there. When you say, what do I do for my meniscus? It's not always the best question. Yeah, usually the question to ask is, why am I putting that extra pressure through the meniscus? Here's the other thing that I hear a lot that I just got to put in there is that people say glute amnesia, right? My glutes have turned off. They're no longer awake. If you can stand, if you can walk, your your glutes are not shut off. Okay. Yeah. Maybe Otherwise, you'd fall straight forward. You would fall completely <laughs> to the ground. So it's not that you have complete amnesia within those glutes. Don't be so afraid that like, oh, it's not activating at all. And like, I've I've had a client where she was at a previous clinician where she was just like, I just cannot activate my glutes at all. They just don't turn on. They do turn on. You just might not have that awareness built in right now. And that's what us as clinicians should be helping you with. Not telling you that it's wrong, it's bad, you're not doing it. <laughs> Just yeah. helping you to understand it in your body. When we start with the hip and start in a very hip dominant pattern mm -hmm. that keeps the knees in a safe place, which is why it's great for us to kind of start there to learn how to control that knee in a safe position to do those hinging and squatting patterns. And that's when we might want to then move into things that are a little more challenging and demanding on the knees yeah. so that we can also progress safe. from there. Also safe. Also safe. Always like safe. I don't want to say that like one thing is safe or not safe. It just, it unloads the knee when you do a lot of hip stuff. So it becomes um, less pressure. So we can decrease the symptoms that you might be having at the knee initially. Yeah, absolutely. And so then that's where 
once we get really used to doing those hip hinging patterns, maybe moving to one leg、mm. and getting used to doing things、mm. on a single、okay. leg, because then that knee is kind of on its own, it doesn't have its other leg to to partner and buddy with and be like, hey, you're there to support me. It's okay. We still can work into some of those mini squats. I love a four-way mini squat is one of my favorites to do personally because it gets me on one leg, reaching a foot out to the side, doing a little bend and tap, reaching a foot out front, doing a little bend and tap, crossing my body, and then going to the back because it teaches my hip through all those range of motion to keep my knee in a good, safe, comfortable position. When I'm on one leg, it is not just about let me just strengthening in the hips, and that's going to help my knee completely. Because the reality is, as you walk downstairs, your knee is going to pass your toe. As you turn and you go and run after your child, your knee is going to rotate in. So it's how can I then create the strength necessary in my knee to be able to better tolerate these positions? Because We are not preventing injury, but we're making our body more prone to controlling and feeling safe and having control in those、yeah. motions when we get put in them in the future. Because again, we like to think that we can always control our environment, but you know, kid runs one way, dog runs the other way, <laughs> and we twist and we turn. And if we've been training those, and if we've been training ourselves to get into kind of these positions that. Again, might be challenging and demanding, but we can safely progress into, and we can create that preparedness in our body、mm-hmm. to be ready for those when we get presented with them. Again, that's kind of why we're showing you this progression to places that you might think are unsafe because that's what has been taught to us at this point. It's just that you want to be smart. Work with someone if you're unsure of how to pattern it, and start to become comfortable. In different positions of that knee, going forward, going side, kind of twisting, and creating that whole stability from your foot even up the chain to your hip. Yeah, and it's all the progression, and that's not the first thing you're going to start with. So、yeah. if you've done everything in order, that's not going to be something that is as scary once you get to it. It's going to seem like an appropriate challenge for you.、Okay. So. Hopefully, all that progression kind of made sense and was easy to follow. <laughs> It's kind of tough for us to talk through it sometimes, but again, we've shown all of these things on our、so、social、much. medias. Look those up. Google the things we're talking about. Thanks so much for joining us today on the PT Pearl. Hopefully, you learned something about your knee, even if it isn't related to meniscus. Any kind of pain on your knee, this stuff can be supportive. So pass it along to a friend. Comment below. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you're gonna try and what you like. Mine exploded about. Subscribe so that you don't miss out and get to hear us again and continue learning with us.